Our last speaker for today is Ms. Evonda Thomas-Smith. She, she currently serves as the director of the Evanston Department of Health and Human Services, which she joined in 2005. She has been an executive public health administrator and public health nurse leader for over 25 years. She has successfully solicited alliances to open the first public um, private collaborative and established a federally qualified health center for Evanston, Illinois. She earned her bachelor degree in community health and nursing before pursuing a master's degree in nursing at Governor's State University in University Park, Illinois. She is currently working to complete a doctorate in public health at Walden University. Please help me welcome Ms. Thomas Smith. Thank you. Okay, so it's always hard to be the last speaker. Um, sometimes it's difficult because you all have been sitting so long. So I'm just gonna ask you to stand so we can get some energy in the room. More energy. We've had fantastic presentations, um, fantastic presentations with robust information. Um, and so we just wanna kinda get some energy in the room because I'm gonna shift the conversation and talk about access to care. I came in the room and I said, wow, I'm not talking about HIV and AIDS, I'm not talking about colorectal cancer, I'm talking globally about access to care. We're still standing, we're still standing. <laughs> so yes, I am a nurse by education and I just love talking about what I do. I love public health. I've been in public health since the first day out of undergrad. And even though my professors told me as a real nurse, you have to work at the bedside. Well, I am a real nurse and I don't work at the bedside. So we're gonna put our arms up to get some energy up high, 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 and we're gonna wiggle those fingers. Then we're gonna give energy to our partners next to us and stretch your arms out. And then we're gonna give energy to our ancestors who have gone on before that we stand on the shoulders of. Is that all right? All right. And then we're gonna clap and get some energy in the room. And then you're gonna wave to somebody that you haven't talked to all day. You're gonna wave to somebody. I don't know anyone in the room, so I'm waving to everyone. Okay, and then we're gonna stretch one more time and down. And then we're gonna have our seats. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna to talk to you really quick. Um, this presentation was done a while ago, and of course in public health, you adjust to change very quick. You adapt, correct? Amen. And so our <laughs> health department has had three different titles. We've been Evanston Health Department, We've been Evanston Health and Human Services, and then we dropped Human Services and went back to Health Department, and just a few weeks ago, we are now what? Evanston Health and Human Services. <laughs> <laughs> but the presentation was already works. done, so I just wanted to make that correction. I want you to know that our mission at Evanston Health Department is to protect, preserve, and promote wellness for people who live, work, and play in our borders with creative, sustainable partnerships. And historically, the health department has taken care of people in crisis. We've been considered safety net providers, and we've been considered the provider to take care of vulnerable populations. Well, when they recruited me from Chicago Department of Public Health, they said, we want you to shift the messaging. And I said, I don't see myself as just a health director. I see myself as like a surgeon general. That means I look across all of the landscape and I make sure that all live in optimal wellness those who are in crisis, those who are vulnerable, but then those who are maintaining their health as well. And there's a measure of optimal wellness that they can dwell in. So I'm that possibilities kind of person. So when they saw me coming, they knew who I was, okay? And so I wanted to kind of frame that because every health department is different. If you've seen one health department, you've only seen one health department. And so I wanted to make sure that we're clear where we're going. Also, because Evanston is a transient community in some regard, we have a university there, as you know, that would be Northwest, Northwest University. So I am a church girl, so we participate. <laughs> okay, so I may have a call and response. Is that okay? That's all right. All right. I know I'm the last speaker, so I'm trying to engage your energy and engage your attention, okay? Um, because we have a transient community at times, because we have students come in and out of our jurisdiction, and I consider the students at Northwestern University a part of my residence, we shaped our mission to include those who live there, work there, and play there. And that is the reason for us to have a more global perspective. 
What people don't know, and what I didn't know, being from the south side of Chicago, I didn't know Evanston had a health department. I did not know that. I had to Google it to um, get directions to do the interview. But Evanston Health Department has been, was organized in 1874. Wow. We were there before both of the hospitals that dwell in my jurisdiction even existed. And so this is just a historical perspective of when we started public health nursing, when we shifted to vision and hearing, and then when we provided primary care. For the essence of time, I'm not going to read everything on my slides. I'm just going to give you a snapshot to get to the meat of the matter. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. But what's critical with this 150-year history that Evanston um, Health Department existed in, we provided senior services, we provided Title X family planning services, we provided STD and STI treatments, we did tuberculosis clinics, we did the gamut of primary care for 155 years. But in 2009, the city council, we had a $9 million organizational budget deficit and so when they looked across the landscape of all of the organizations, they came to the health department and cut our budget by $1 million. Now again, this was the time that I had been there about a year and a half, and I was recruited for the sole purpose of managing the personal health services. Again, I'm a nurse, you know that. And as a clinician, the whole goal for me was to reshape our clinical operations. And then to be in a city council meeting and say, you know, we're going to go into dig deep into the budget of the health department and end all five of those clinics. And so that is what occurred. Also, from a career perspective, when we when they cut my budget by a million dollars and ended the clinical services, I had to lay off 15 of my clinicians, medical providers, nursing, um, MAs, CNAs. And not only were they told they were going to be laid off, they were told six months prior mm. to the layoff. So from a career perspective, I had 15 individuals knowing that they were going to end employment in six months. And then I had other individuals knowing that they were going to sustain employment. And so I had the surviving guilt and I had the walking wounded. And we still had to operate as a unit and still had to operate and provide clinical services knowing that we were transitioning out over a six month period of time challenging time but what was interesting was no matter how compelling my story and my data represented that this is what our community is going to shift and look like if we end these clinical services we've had generations of families coming in our doors getting medical care we are the trusted gatekeeper in this community in terms of primary care particularly for low-income families who look like myself and i said if we shift out of this so drastically where will our families go well, what people don't know about Evanston, Evanstonians like to stay in Evanston. It doesn't matter if there are FQHCs, look-alike community health clinics on the borders, because there were. Evanstonians like staying in Evanston. Evanstonians had generations of families who used our health department. And so when those services shift, there was a shift in the community. Of course, no surprise to you in the room. So we had to create an action plan. So the mayor, Mayor Tisdall, to her credit, came to me and said, hey, Bobby, you've been sharing data with the city council, and I'll share later with you the significant data that was unacceptable. Our STD and STI rates increased in two years by 25%. Now, some would say, well, nationally, that kind of looks the same. Actually, our numbers were worse nationally and our numbers were worse from our county perspective. And Evanston, that was unacceptable. But when I dug down deep into the data, who did that represent? It represented our 14 to 19 year olds, primarily young girls of color. And so I shared that information, I repeated that information, but it wasn't until I was able to do some further research and connect the dots of how STDs and STIs show up and manifest in uh, fertility, infertility. And so when you talk about connecting the dots from scar tissue, um, from untreated infections, repeated infections, you're talking about manifestations that show up in a different population. And that population were particularly women who were in their mid 40s, trying to conceive and having significant failures in doing that. And these were women who were not of color. So you have one population that you're really most concerned about, 
but you have another population that maybe others are concerned about. And until I was able to frame that picture and connect those dots, access to care was never an issue until I was able to connect those dots. So the mayor came to me and said, Ivonda, we made the worst vote ever to end your clinics. Restore those clinics. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I have a million dollars. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sure that as creative as you can be, you can figure that out. I know you can create a plan, and I thought, sure I can. So I had an action, I had a mandate to restore services, and that was the mandate. How I did it was my option, okay? So that's the key. So we invited an established community-based health center and FQHC partner to come to the table and ask us, how do we do that? I had to leverage those creative and sustainable partnerships that I talked about in my mission. And then we sent a letter of intent. Our letter of intent to HRSA, which is our federal body for funding for federally qualified health centers, had 30 supporting community partners. Not only did my two hospitals sign an MOU, they signed an MOU with the city of Evanston. So we had a governing municipality that led the charge to establish our first federally qualified health center. And the reason why I say that is because Evanston is perceived to be incredibly resource rich, and we are, but there is a gap of need that you have to justify to receive federal funds. Now, if anybody knows anything about Evanston, do you think that was easy to do in terms of what people think about Evanston? Northwestern, million dollar homes on the lake. Do you think that was a, a, a great feat or it was something easy to do? What do you think? Those of you who know anything about Evanston. <laughs> now you do. It was very challenging. I was competing with those who were at the table from my southern col uh, counties. Harvey, Illinois, and Markham, Illinois, and um, communities that had horrific disparaging health disparities for families of color. And then Evanston had this little window of opportunity that there was a little niche in Evanston that was still considered medically underserved um, and medically underserved by professionals. And remember, I have two hospitals in my jurisdiction. So it wasn't an easy feat. So we did have some challenges, but the need and the story that we share actually um, kind of helps frame our work. So here are some stats that I'm going to share with you because uh, I've got 15 minutes. The significant issue for us was our gonorrhea and chlamydia rates for our 14 to 19 year old age groups. Now mind you, we have a school-based health center that we're a partner of, but the challenge we saw was the young women that were being treated in the school-based health center had to opt in. You had to get permission. For the health department, we had a Title X grant where you could receive care without parental consent. Also, we were a provider that unfortunately took care of the partners of these young women because typically in our jurisdiction, the partners of these young women who were getting reinfected over and over and over were much older and could not benefit from the school-based health center. So we were that hub that took care of those partners for treatment, and we were also the provider that provided care without parental consent because of our grant funding. Then there were some other issues that were raised. As you can see in Cook County, 8.3% of our adults are diagnosed with diabetes compared to our national rate of 6.5. African Americans and Hispanics are disproportionately affected by diabetes and complications. These are things that we know. And nationally, our numbers kind of rose above in terms of our population and our jurisdiction. And in terms of oral health, we see this nationally as, I'm sorry, nationally as well that 20% of suburban residents reported they could not afford a dentist in the last 12 months, and low-income residents wait up to four months for a routine dental appointment and a year for restorative services, if at all they engage in these kinds of services. So our capital campaign started in November of 2010, and what we said was the health department has never marketed and raised money. That's not what we do. That's what some of my nonprofit peers do, and they do that well. We took the nonprofit model of some of our partners and established a capital campaign, um, a capital campaign for our health center. So I went to the hospitals, and the CEO of the hospital, who is a good friend of mine, dear friend of mine, he said, I want to help you, Yvonne, but you've got one ask. 
You've got one ask. Well, raise this capital money, but you can't come back for more money. He said it eloquently, but that's basically what he said. <laughs> and so that one ask gave us $2.8 million. Okay. And we were able to raise the capital, the capital campaign, and we got about $3.3 million. But the edifice that we erected in Evanston was $5 million. And don't families deserve that kind of commitment? Mm -hmm. So our community, thank you. <laughs> our community-based health center is located in the city of Evanston, but it's operated by Erie Family Health Center. Our hospital partners are North Shore Evanston Hospital and Resurrection St. Francis, which is now Presence Hospital. Our civic partners were the city of Evanston, and they projected to care for 4,000 patients, and we're already up to 5,500 patients. They've been open for two years, and they started in our borders at the health department because we knew if they were in the health department, families are used to coming to us as their site, and that they would instantly gain some level of trust. Because again, when new partners come into our borders, Evanstonians are kind of um, skeptical, and because they were in our borders at the health department in the basement of the Civic Center, it built in some inherent trust. And now they live and dwell in their own operations, which is about maybe a, a mile or two from the Civic Center Health Department, and they're independent and operating on their own. So we're clear that we were a part of a system, and until we shored up the public health system, not just take on medical services, not just reestablish primary care, but really build the infrastructure of the system, that was the only way that we were going to be able to really address access to care. Now, Erie Family Health Center does have primary care, behavioral health services, as well as dentistry. And these were all needs that we identified through our community health assessment and through our community health improvement plan. So Erie has been a fantastic partner, but it wasn't until we began to have a conversation um, to reestablish our services for our families of color. When you primarily walk into the borders of Evanston uh, Skokie Health Center, you will see many, many ethnic groups, many, many uh, families that were out of care um, for over three years. Because as you know, when, when providers uh, close up their doors, we started to see an increase in our ER visits, an increase in community benefit, which are relative to our taxpayers' dollars. So you have to frame the story. You can reduce your community benefit and get better, frag better care and not provide fragmented care for families who deserve holistic presentation of care. So basically, I think that's my last slide. Um, I do kind of talk quickly because I get excited. Um, but this has been meaning, meaningful work because I will tell you, I reached out to peers um, across several counties and they said, Yvonne, you don't want to do that. And FQHC will take you about 10 years. You'll never see your vision. You'll never see it come to life. You'll never get the funding. I will tell you the first application we did submit, HRSA said, this is approved, but there's no funding. And so I said, so now that I know that I have a quality application, and mind you, I'm not, I wasn't really known in Washington. We didn't make the right context in Washington. And so they said, well, leave your application in play and maybe the next year you may get funding, but instead of funding being $650,000 annually, it'll be reduced to three twenty dollars annually because that's the second round of funding. So I told Lee Francis, the president of Erie Family Health Center, I said, you know what? When a Super Bowl football team goes out on the field or a Super Bowl, somebody knows that they're going to come home with the ring, right? I said, bring me the ring. Bring me the ring. And so I was in Denver, Colorado at a conference, and I got a phone call, and the first voice I heard was Dr. Lee Francis saying, I got the ring. And that's because he got the letter that not only did we get approved for funding, remember I told you the second round of funding is 320. We got approved for the full $650,000 annually. And so, the, uh, as you know, a federally qualified health center is supported um, federally, operationally, every year. So we don't expect our doors to close. The need is there. The families are happy. They're getting the services they, they deserve. And then, of course, with the Affordable Care Act, we're expanding our services and pro providing more service. So on that note, I'll end. Do you have any questions? Because I have five minutes left.
And I love to entertain questions. Yes. Yes, we did. And the application, again, was approved and not, they ran out of money. Um, and we were asked to leave our application in place. Now, there were some political nuances that we had to work. Our mayor did go to Washington a couple of times and sit with Senator Dick Durbin and uh, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who have local offices in Evanston. And so there was some um, introductions that needed to be made because again, we didn't have that connection. We had never had a federally qualified health center in Evanston. And I had senators emailing me directly saying, Evanston, you don't need anything in Evanston. You know, because there was not a justification of need. But you and I and everyone in this room knows that as affluent as your area may be, there's always a pocket of families who fall under the radar. Um, and 12% of our population, which is 75,000, live 200% below the poverty line, 12%. And that is an unacceptable number for me to not address. So thank you for your question. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank Dr. Brown, and I want to thank uh, your association and the executive committee for reaching out to me, asking me to come and join you. Um, I will tell you, um, I had a great time getting here, especially since I was at the Hyatt Regency of <laughs> McCormick. Um, and so I'm glad that I was able to make it and find the correct location. And I thank you for allowing me to share my story. Um, I share my story because I want to encourage those of us who are in the trenches making things happen for the families that we serve. I'm honored to serve my jurisdiction. I'm honored to um, serve the, the families. And then I'm grateful that I can see the beginning, the middle, and an end, and I can see the fruit of my labor. So thank you again, and I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to bring up the, uh, we have a little bit of time. Um, I'd like to bring up all of the presenters from the Scientific Symposium and, uh, uh, Ms. Thomas Smith, if you have any other questions, um, we would like to take your questions. Ma'am, you had one before we closed out earlier. This is an opportunity for you as well. So if the presenters can come back up. Again, thank you all for participating um, in the Scientific Symposium and um, Ms. E Thomas Smith for your presentation as well. I thoroughly enjoyed it and it obviously gives um, those of us who are still growing in public health some hope. I mean, we all hear about the corruption in the Chicago and Illinois area, so it was very encouraging to hear that despite all of the um, obstacles you had um, through, you know, in, in getting the health department back together, that you were able to do so. So thank you for thank that. You. Thank you. Ma'am. Uh, on the HIV question, um, with regard to uh, the African Americans not being uh, as quickly informed or as well informed about PrEP and PEP, I was, <clears throat> I was wondering in the, in the slide that about the people who were actually under art therapy, there was a considerable difference in that clinic between the people who actually were on treatment in the African American group. And I wondered if that could have accounted for a lot of the difference. If you look, I know in our clinics in Maryland, we've had, there's always some people who are in denial, they don't take the treatment, or they are hard to find, or they, you know, like you say, fall out of care and then come back into care. And to me, that population may be a group that could be targeted to particularly work on in terms of getting them familiar with social media, with some of the information that, that people can get, because they're really a tough population, but if you could break, but you have them. You know, they are coming to the clinic, but they, there may be something else holding them back from really engaging with the information that's out there. So that, that is a great point. So, like I said, so the individuals who were, who, so we asked, are you currently on ART, or have you ever taken ART? Um, and so we were, we're going to look at adherence um, as well. So for that, it's, it's, it's a great point. So somebody who reported no to currently being on art or ever being on art could have been newly diagnosed. And so they're gonna be different 
in, in information that they've received on PrEP from a provider in a previous um, doctor's appointment, um, you know, individuals who've been coming for a long time compared to somebody who's just coming in for the very first time for any contact with that physician. So that's really nice. Are there any other questions for our presenters? <laughs> I guess for um, the other side, uh, when you're thinking about establishing a partnership, what factors do you think are needed to, to put in place? Sure. So um, I typically will convene um, several community stakeholders. I can stand. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, because we're a certified local health department, there are four in the state of Illinois outside of Chicago. We convene often our community stakeholders and we do a community health assessment and then when we get the data, we share it back with our community stakeholders in like a town hall meeting forum and then we really solicit what's important to them. When we identify what those health priorities are, then we do asset mapping, resiliency testing, and then we challenge our partners, if we wanna address this from a strategic standpoint, what are we offering to the solution? So not only do we identify problems, we ask the uh, people who identify problems, what are some options of solutions and what resources, human capital, fiscal capital, that they can lend to that initiative. And then when we have a gap, when we have no resources in the community, we have no uh, capital, human capital, or resources, then we strategize on how we can address the gap. So actually, and, and then we challenge each other, who's not at the table? Because we have people who show up uh, regularly because maybe that's their form of work, but I really challenge us to invite those that we don't reach out to, like our community organizers who do it so well. We reach out to veterinary medicine. We reach out to our uh, coroner's office. So we try to look beyond public health for sure. Um, and we reach out to those uh, people who are thinking health and all policies, urban planners. We look at land use, transportation. And so we force ourselves to broaden our perspective. And then we invite our community partners to help us do that as well. Did that answer your question? Okay. Any final thoughts, questions? Dr. I'm, I'm curious, has any of you heard of the David Lynch Foundation and you know about the program, the, know about their programs at all? Uh, one of the reasons it's relevant to your presentation is they recently got a $300,000 grant in Chicago uh, to work with the Sh uh, Chicago Crime Lab, uh, um, I'm blocking on the total name of it, to uh, bring transcendental meditation to young people in schools in Chicago to reduce violence. Uh, but they have programs for people with HIV, programs for women who've been victims of domestic violence, programs for veterans suffering from PTSD, and other groups too. So it's something that you might want to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Dr. Brown, would you join me up here, please? Uh, I'd just like to um, thank all of the presenters for today, and especially for our young people who brave enough to get up here and present their research. The part that they don't know is, and that we don't advertise is that a part of the encouragement is not only for them to get up and share their research and we provide them feedback, but we also provide prizes. And so I'd like to present the winners for the Scientific Symposium Committee. Oh, yes. Really quickly. It's always like a, a dissertation defense in here <laughs> after the scientific symposium. I've never participated in the symposium other than being a judge, so I commend you all for getting up here because some of the questions that were posed were very tough. They require a lot of on-your-feet thinking, so just an extra kudos to you. So our first winner is will be gifted with a $200 check. <laughs> that winner is Uchechi Mitchell.
Our second place winner will be gifted with a $100 check, and that is Al Denise Ewing. There were two presenters. Um, did she? Did she? Leave? Oh, there she is. Okay. We had two presenters um, for this presentation, so you guys gotta fight over that hundred dollars. <laughs> Move over to the left. It's got a, the way. screen. You got the screen, yeah. Good. Yeah, move in front of the pump there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our third place winner is Courtney Maya Hoffer, and we like to keep those people around, so we come up with a clever way to do it. We give them a free membership. We will see you in Denver. That's why I hear the next one is Denver. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your questions. I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown. Can we give everyone a round of applause? Thank you. At the beginning of the meeting, I failed to acknowledge our conference committee. I think several of them had to leave and go to governing councils. We have some folks who are very busy who take a lot of their time um, or give a lot of their time for planning SAFI's meeting. So I just wanted to thank them and acknowledge them for all the hard work that they put in. And it's not just our conference committee. Our membership committee um, has a lot of work to do. Our uh, marketing and communications committee, our finance, all of our committees work together to pull this off. So thank you all so much for coming to see the fruits of our labor. Um, I just wanted to remind you all that we are having a social that starts at 6 o'clock at M Lounge on Wabash, Waybash, Wabash, Wabash, thank you, <laughs> Avenue um, from 6 to 8. We have a lot of folks who have RSVP'd, so you can come and go as you please within um, the time from 6 to 8. We also have our mentoring roundtable. It's not too late to register. Um, it's not just for students. If you are early career, even some, we, based on our mentors, we can even mentor some mid-career folks. So please feel free to come out tomorrow at 8 in room W184D of the Convention Center. And immediately following will be our business meeting. As I mentioned before, this is gonna, we are going into year 25. So we wanna make next year a spectacular event for everyone to come and see all of the um, hard work that people have put into SAFI over the past two and a half decades. And unless there are any questions or comments, for anything else, any concerns, then we are adjourned and we look forward to seeing you all in Denver. Uh, no, before Denver, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <And> tomorrow. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. Yes. Oh, I'm done. I'd just like to get a picture with the okay. uh, scientific Thank symbolism. you all. Enjoy your day. Stay dry. And all the sorrows in the room. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the sorrows in the room.